Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the lessons we've learned by collecting data on super Earths in terms of their composition and what that has informed us about how these planets form. So let's start um, by recapping how it is that planets acquire the composition they do. Uh, we think that planets form uh, in the solar nebula and the first step is that pre-solar grains um, condense out of the solar nebula we think that they acquire the same refractory ratios and the same chemical signature in this early phase. And then by processes that we don't fully understand, they grow from dust-sized particles to oligarchs. Uh, planets are around 100, 1,000 kilometers in size. And again, in this period, we don't think that there's a lot of chemical processing going on. However, when they become big enough to interact gravitationally, they're going to start colliding in this giant impact phase and perhaps um, modify their composition um, during these collisions. We also uh, think that there could be outgassing of atmospheres or atmospheric evaporation or atmospheric loss um, that can modify the composition of a planet, but by the end you end up with a planet of a certain mass, a certain radius, and a certain composition that reflects all these processes that produced this outcome. And so I want to argue in this talk that we have now enough information on the composition of super-Earths that we can try to tie together this information to the pathways of formation for these planets. And so uh, let's start from the beginning um, by showing all the planets for which we have a measurement in radius, um, uh, organized uh, with orbital period. To show you that there, we've discovered a myriad of planets, some that are very big um, and some that are much more compact, even though our biases are to detecting these larger ones. So in fact, these are the so-called hot Jupiters because they're easy to detect, they have short periods, very big planets. But we have extended our observations to include planets that are farther away and planets that are very small. In our attempt to categorize planets um, and, and understand their characteristics, we've used radius as a proxy to divide these categories. And so we call mini Neptunes planets that are around four to, uh, two to four Earth radii and have um, an envelope and distinguish them from the ones that are more compact perhaps and they could maybe resemble uh, the Earth and we call them super Earths. However, these lines are a little bit blurry. Uh, nature doesn't like to um, conform to these categories, but it, there's, there's um, use to this as a simple way of dividing them. And of course, we also have the more smaller planets that are size of the Earth are smaller, um, that we think perhaps resemble the Earth uh, much more. But in any case, despite the difficulties of observing these planets, uh, when we, once we detrend this, um, this uh, space and we've taken all the biases out of our observations, we determine that, and it's been now almost a, a decade, that these super-Earths and mini-Neptunes are the most common astrophysical objects. And I would like to argue that if we understand how they formed, we have a very good chance of understanding how planets form in general. And... My, um, my goal for today's talk is to bring to your attention that composition is a new axis that we can use to constrain this formation pathways. So instead of um, just showing radius, if I also show you the planets for which we have mass measurements, um, this is the figure that I, that, that I present to you. This is radius in uh, the y-axis. Uh, and mass in the x-axis in logarithmic scale, you'll see these figures, uh, many of them throughout my talk. Uh, planets are going to be color-coded according to their equilibrium temperature. And you see that um, there's some big planets, some medium-sized planets, and some small planets reflecting all the variation in sizes and masses that is um, that we see in nature. Now, the first question we like to ask is what are planets made of? And that's the power of having both masses and radius, because now we can try to understand what the bulk composition. And what we do first is to compare these um, the sizes to what planets would, uh, how big they would be if they were pure N members. And what I mean by this is that we look at the building blocks of planets, like hydrogen and helium, uh, water and ices, and more compact rocks, 
and compare the sizes of planets that would be completely made out of one of these three materials and see how our planet uh, compares. Um, so for example, um, this is a line showing you the mass radius relationship for water at 1500 Kelvin. And so for a two Earth mass planet, this is how big the planet would be. Any planet that stands above that um, has to be made of lighter material. And so for this case, we would say that these planets are made of hydrogen and helium. When you're comparing to this hydrogen and helium line and you uh, pick a planet with this corresponding temperature, any planet that is above these lines, um, they have to be lighter or um, have some sort of missing physics basically to explain why they are not made out of only hydrogen and helium since uh, that's the lighter material we can invoke. Uh, but that's the subject of um, another talk and I believe Daniel uh, Thorngren will talk about this in this session. I want to argue that our uh, best bet to constrain composition uh, and in exoplanets and therefore formation is to focus on these small planets over here. And um, it has taken a really long time to build this data set uh, and, and be large enough for us to do population studies. And I want to tell you first, I want to show you the first two planets that, uh, in this regime that had a mass and radius measurements. This was Coro 7b and JG 1214b. I was discovered in 2009. And you can see already that uh, they are very different planets, uh, even though they have not very different masses. Uh, and so let me just explain to you a little bit more what these lines are. This region here is the region where any rocky planet could lie. Uh, and so we have, a, again, an end member that is unrealistic perhaps, and it's a pure iron composition. And so for a four Earth mass planet, this is how big a pure iron ball would be. We don't expect any planets to be here. If we put uh, now more silicate rocks, you can end up with a mercury composition or an earth-like composition. And you've taken out all the iron from a planet, but have kept all the relevant faces, you end up with this line that we like to call the rocky threshold radius. It sometimes differs from pure uh, rocks that are shown in other studies because they might not consider all the possible faces. But this line is a very useful line because it divides the planets that are above and require a volatile or a lighter element um, versus the ones that could be rocky because they stand below. And any planet that stands below um, could still have volatiles because we can trade off putting some volatiles in as long as we put more iron in the planet as well. Um, these are lines that show you the mass and radius uh, relationships for an Earth-like planet that has 1% of atmosphere or 10% of atmosphere at different temperatures, just to show you that um, a little bit of hydrogen and helium goes a long way in affecting its radius. In contrast to, you need a lot of iron to change the radius of a rocky planet. So moving on to now showing you all the data that we have collected in this regime, this is the sample that we have so far to work with. And so um, these planets here are the ones the subject of a study uh, that we did with my grad student last year, updated to what uh, the new discoveries have, uh, have been done in this year. And um, I want to argue that these planets here have, as I said, are better suited for compositional studies because they don't suffer from the degeneracies that the planets that have an envelope do. So planets that have an envelope, they could, these envelopes could be made of hydrogen and helium uh, or water, anisis, and we don't really know the proportions of the mantle to cores that are mostly made of magnesium silicon mantles or iron cores. So in reality, we have four unknowns that we need to determine in order to know its composition, but only two data points. And so uh, these planets, uh, they're unconstrained when it comes to determining their composition. However, the smaller planets don't suffer from that, and I'll show you in a second. But before I move on, I just want to bring to your attention to this very particular planet that stands above this RTR line, and it's incredibly hot. And so um, it poses a lot of questions as to how it retained its atmosphere being so hot and vulnerable to um, atmospheric evaporation. And I encourage you to look at the poster by Casey Bergman uh, for the fantastic work that she's done on this planet. Uh, 
Okay, so as I promised, these planets here are the ones that I believe are uh, good, um, promising to pursue because the main uh, constraints that we need to place on is the amount of mantle material to iron cores. And so there's two unknowns and two data points, so it's better constrained. It's not completely constrained because there's degeneracies arising, um, degeneracies arising from the degree of differentiation, for example, but they are small compared to the sizes of the error bars. So at this point, we don't need to worry about that. And so we looked at the sample and asked the question, how does the composition of rocky super Earths compare to that of stars? And um, I want to introduce the, the student that did the heavy lifting of this work. This is Michael Plotnikov, and he did fantastic work um, answering a question that was inspired by previous assumptions put forward by different groups. In an attempt to reduce the degeneracy inherent on these low-mass planets, um, other works had suggested that the refractory ratios of planets should be the same as that of stars. And so we wanted to um, invert the suggestion into a question and ask if the data supported this uh, primordial composition for super-Earths. And so for that, we needed to revamp um, the internal structure code I did more than a decade ago, um, 15 years ago. and. Um, include all the new equations of state, allow for all possible compositions. We allow for different allos in the core, um, even though in the end we decided to only focus on silica because that's what uh, we're going to compare to when it comes to stars. And after we revamped the code, we successfully compared to what an Earth would look like um, compared to the preliminary reference Earth model that is done for Earth and obtain this workhorse of a model where if we have the composition of a planet in terms of these parameters and the mass, we obtain the radius. And the parameters that we were interested in was the core mass fraction, how much mass was in the core, allowing the core to have some silica, that's the amount of silica in the core, and also allowing the mantle to have some iron. And these, we allow them to vary. Um, and so having this, this um, this internal structure model, we paired it with an MCMC code to constrain the composition for each planet in our sample, given the mass data and the radius data, including their um, error bars. And from that, we sampled all the parameter space and obtained what kind of composition in this terms of these parameters could fit the data and derive from there the amount of iron to silica and iron to magnesium ratio. So this is one example um, of a planet, 55 Cancri E. You see the masses, the radius, the core mass fraction that we recovered, the amount of silicon in the core, the amount of iron in the mantle on these two derived parameters. Clearly, you see that the core mass fraction is the one that has the most impact on, um, on the radius given a mass. And so uh, we did this for one planet and we did it for all the planets in our sample. This is another figure showing the same, the same sample. This is actually updated from what we presented a year ago and it's published, as I said, to include planets, uh, for example, the Trappist-1 planets that have exquisite uh, information now thanks to the work of uh, Eagle and co-workers. And so we did this and here are the main results. So this is a figure showing you the iron to silica uh, by weight ratio versus the iron to magnesium by weight ratio for um, the planet's iron sample. I forgot to tell you that one other thing that we did was to um, distinguish the planets that intersected this rocky threshold radius because uh, they could also have a volatile component um, from the ones that are completely embedded within the rocky region. It's always the case that any of these planets can have volatiles, as I explained before, but it just becomes harder to invoke that volatile composition um, for this very iron-rich planets. So again, iron-rich planets uh, follow this uh, increasing uh, amount of iron lines. Okay, so going back to the results, we have the green planets are the ones that are really embedded in the rocky region, and the purple planets are the ones that are, that intersect the, the volatile region. And in compared to last year, we also included planets that could have liquid water on their surface, but didn't model them that way. We modeled them completely as rocky planets. Um, and so what it means is that these planets in reality, these values are an upper limit 
uh, so, sorry, a lower limit for iron. They could, in fact, be more enriched in iron for the rocky part, given that they could have liquid water uh, on their surface. And so you can see that they span a wide range compared to the stars. So these are the stars values taken from the Hypatia catalog. Here is the reference. And you see the one sigma value uh, contour and the two sigma value contour. And in yellow, you have the different uh, measurements for different uh, car, um, chondrites um, in the solar system, showing you the variation that we see in the meteoritic um, samples for their solar system. And so despite the fact that we have large error bars, it really does seem that um, the planets is an, a wider range of compositions compared to that of stars. We can uh, look at these uh, two populations and compare them together, and we do this in two different spaces. We use the, uh, the ratios, the refractio ratios, so these are the stars, um, um, marginalized distribution by bootstrapping the, the sample of, of stars, and we do the same for our planets. And even in this, in this uh, space of iron to silica, you can see an excess of planets here that have more iron with respect to that of stars. But um, this ratio is a nonlinear ratio that accentuates or hides some of the trends. So we decided to, instead of comparing in this space, decide to translate the composition of stars to a composition of a planet in terms of core mass fraction if those planets were identical to the stars in terms of the refractory material. And so that's what you see over here. here. These are the stars, um, the producing planets with um, the same composition, primordial composition, as shown in core mass fraction, and these are the planets that we see in our sample. And so again, it's more clearly uh, shown here that there's an excess of planets that are iron rich. Uh, I wouldn't put too much attention as to where these um, uh, the means are because again the mean is being influenced by planets in this purple um, region in this purple label that could be volatile so in fact that's a lower limit. Um, so uh, we can as I said translate what the stars uh, look like if they were producing primordial uh, planets and show them into a radius mass relationship. So you have here the planets in our sample and you have the distribution of stars or planets around stars with primordial composition. And you can see that despite the fact that the stars do have uh, some, some spread, it's just not enough to really change the radius of a planet. And for those that would like to show this in their, in their figures, um, and as a quick comparison, uh, Michael has um, some repositories and, and some easy to use code in his GitHub webpage so that you can reproduce figures like this when you discover a planet and compare it to the population of stars. Okay, so armed with this, we wanted to see if there were any trends um, in the data with insulation to try to see if we could see... Um, any evidence of this radius gap happening for these planets. And uh, we have ordered them here, core mass fraction as a function of insulation. And again, distinguish the planets that are embedded in the rocky region versus the ones that could be volatile. So all of these are really lower limits. And uh, you can see that there's a large spread in composition. Um, the planets, we don't see a lot of planets here, but that's because we don't see a lot of cold planets to begin with. But perhaps there is a trend to investigate as more data comes in. Uh, interestingly, these planets over here are very highly irradiated. And so uh, if atmospheric evaporation is really uh, sculpting the 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 population of rocky planets by being the outcome of envelopes that were lost from uh, mini Neptunes or from Neptune like planets, then these planets would have to be uh, iron poor. If they are really rocky, they have to be iron poor, and the likelihood of them being rocky increases because they have high insulation values. However, you'll see at the end of my talk that we don't have a reliable theory to produce iron depleted planets. Um, so aside from that, I think in this figure, what we see is that there's, um, there doesn't seem to be an obvious trend uh, of core mass fraction with insulation. Uh, 
And to compare apples to apples as much as we could, we introduced the uncompressed density that is widely used in planetary sciences to our exoplanet study because it's more powerful than using a bulk density. Bulk density is convenient, but it confounds um, both composition and pressure regime. So this is a, a clear example where we have the planet's bulk density and you have Mercury and Earth's bulk density that show that they have the same uh, bulk density despite the fact that they are chemically distinct planets. Instead, we use the uncompressed density, which means that we take the rocks that build the planet and uh, move them to a reference pressure and uh, calculate the density there. And so that's the uncompressed density here as a function of radius for the planets in our sample, color-coded according to where they're embedded or, or um, maybe in the volatile region. Uh, but also the symbol size tells you how insulated they are, how much radiation uh, from the star they're receiving. And so in this type of diagram, what we are biased towards is this high uncompressed material. That means for a given radius, we are biases to larger masses. And so larger masses translates to larger uncompressed densities. So this region is better observed, uh, easier to observe than this uh, part of the diagram. So, oh, uh, so this part here is real. This lack of planets that we have uh, in this uh, region of space is real. We don't see a lot of planets this big and with this high densities. Uh, basically, I think we are seeing the uh, the envelope of the uh, core accretion runaway core uh, runaway of core accretion model, where by the time they get to this sizes, planets start acquiring uh, their envelopes and uh, decreasing in their um, density, uncompressed density. But um, if you focus on the planets that are um, Below uh, this sort of region, you see that there's a big, um, there, all sorts of values are allowed. Uh, however, it does seem to be that there is a maximum of iron enrichment, again, because we're biased to seeing anything above. So it seems like perhaps from formation, there seems to be some sort of maximum iron enrichment acquired of about 6 grams per uh, cc. Uh, I think it's still preliminary given the error bars in the data, but it's something to, that we want to keep monitoring to see how real it is and if formation theories uh, need to explain this value. And uh, the last point I want to make is, that, is to show you that um, if you focus only on the planets that are highly irradiated and susceptible to atmospheric evaporation, you see them in green and purple, um, these big squares. If indeed these planets are the product of atmospheric evaporation. These, uh, this uh, variation in, in chemistry needs to be set before the solar nebula was completely dispersed. Um, or in turn, if um, perhaps these, this variation is coming uh, naturally from atmospheric loss happening through giant impact collisions that also modify the rocky interior. So I think we're starting to see something in the data that we might connect to planet formation theories. The last thing we did um, a year ago was try to compare um, planets to their particular host stars, not in a population sense, but in a one-to-one -one comparison. And so you see the stars are in red and the planets are either in purple or in green. And in some cases, the stars measurements were very large to really uh, uh, be very helpful. And in most cases, actually, were the planets that have um, mass radius, mass measurements that are large enough uh, for us to draw definite conclusions. So we, did, we, we concluded that the errors in the data were too large to offer clear conclusions at that point. Uh, since then, there's been other studies that had, uh, have followed and are complementary to our work. So this is work by Schulze, um, 2021, hopefully I pronounced the name correctly, where they, they, they looked at planets, uh, all of them are in our sample actually, but they looked at their host stars as well. And um, they, they concluded, for example, for Kepler's 107c that there is clear distinction, but in the other ones, they don't think there is. Uh, enough of a distinction to say they're not primordial. I My conclusion is that uh, the data is just not there yet to completely 
um, make definite conclusions. Other intriguing work is the work by Adibe Kenyan uh, this year as well. And so they looked at, uh, they looked at a, in a population sense, but they looked at um, trends in the iron of planets um, and compared them to that of the iron of stars. And they seem to see a trend. These are two different interior models for the planets, but they seem to see a trend um, of more, the, the more iron rich the star is, they seems to be forming a more iron rich planet. So again, the data is a little bit uh, large in their in their error bars, but it's an intriguing result that we should keep an eye on as our data set increases. However, um, I, I want to mention the issues we have um, of these studies uh, because they're important in our moving forward. And the first one and the most important is that we are dealing with an inhomogeneous sample of planets. All of these, uh, we've collected data with a lot of effort and I commend all the observers for getting good masses on, on planets that are very compact. Um, but everybody has their own technique that leads to differences in planets. These are three planets that I just picked kind of randomly. Um, and you see the different uh, reported values for the mass and the radius. In some cases, they are within one sigma value. However, in terms of internal structure models, that does really change uh, what the planet is made out of. Um, for example, 55 can create, in some cases, it cannot be rocky. And so the um, it would be good to have a more homogeneous sample or to be uh, to, to be more transparent of how the data was reduced as to try to reproduce a homogeneous sample after the fact. And one good example is the, uh, the work by Johanna Teske with the Magellan Test Survey, where um, they have a homogeneous sample of planets spanning the radius valley, uh, where they have clear criteria and observations that try to de-bias um, any, any data collection. Um, another another problem that we faced was that many stars don't have measurements um, for iron, and if they do have for iron, there's many unreported values for magnesium and silica. So this is a call to anybody that's doing uh, work on stars composition to please provide us with these values. Lovely if they could report also uh, error bars because most of the ones we saw don't have any error bars. Um, and the last point is that that was made in 2018 uh, by Monted and Bird and co-workers is that the data collection criteria is biased towards larger masses because in an effort to acquire a particular accuracy, uh, it's easier to do that when the planet is, um, is more massive. And so this biases our sample um, as well. So it's good to keep in mind how to correct these so that we can move forward in our effort to constrain formation from composition. Um, and just because uh, I, I preview the fact that forming iron poor uh, planets is difficult, I wanted to just briefly talk in the next two minutes about work that another graduate student is doing in terms of a theoretical side to try to explain the spread in composition from the very iron poor to the very iron rich. And so this is work done by Jennifer Scora, uh, where we ask, what is the variety in composition expected from rocky planet formation processes? This was in collaboration with Alessandro Morbidelli and Seth Jacobson. And so we were interested in this giant impact phase and understand how that modifies the composition of growing planets. And so we use an n-body code that um, takes into account collisions and the debris that they're produced. You'll see uh, in a few seconds that there's going to be a collision around here and there's going to be a lot of debris produced. And we track what kind of uh, collisions are, are possible, what kind of debris is expected, and the composition of this debris uh, so that we track how the... There you go. This is the collision. And we track how the uh, composition of the planets gets set throughout formation. And so at the end, uh, for for each of our runs, we, we end up with uh, a bunch of maybe four or five, three planets with Earth and super Earth's masses. Uh, we know the composition, and then we can compare it to the data. And we run a grid of models for different surface densities, uh, embryo masses, etc. 
and we look at all the possible collisions that they, they had. We had a prescription based on the work by Lineheart and Stewart in 2012 on what kind of collisions are expected provided their impact velocity and their impact angle. Um, and uh, so this very careful work was done with Jen and she was able to obtain what kind of planets you form um, from, from uh, in including the giant impact collisions. And so this is again a figure showing radius versus mass. The planets in our sample um, in this case are the ones in color, but the ones that were modeled are the ones in purple. And so we started with a, uh, a sun-like composition uh, which is one line here. And through these collisions, planets do move around a little bit and end up at more iron-rich um, compositions, but we didn't see any planet really deviating from uh, very little uh, from an iron-poor composition. So basically, this region over here, uh, we were not able to obtain. Even though we did see a spread in composition, it's not enough to explain super-Earth data, and that's our main conclusion for that study. And so, it, of course, it means we have to understand better how planets form, um, because it does seem that these planets are real. And so, in summary, there appears to be a large chemical refractory spread in planets more than in stars. If... if uh, there are many planets that, if rocky, they would be very depleted in iron with respect to the stars. And so it puts the onus on trying to see how you can form them, uh, which we haven't been successful at. Uh, when performing one-to-one -one comparisons, it seems to me right now that the errors preclude us from making definite conclusions. But this, I would say, is the first step into building a sample where we can make definite conclusions. It seems to be that there's a maximum iron enrichment of six grams per cc, perhaps coming um, from formation processes that need to be explained. But again, this is preliminary and we need to keep monitoring. And as I said, giant impact collisions uh, widen the primordial distribution, but only modestly. So in fact, forming an iron depleted and iron rich massive rocky planet is very difficult. So hopefully we're at the beginning of combining composition and formation, and we need to both improve our data collection from the um, the mass and radius side to understand composition, and we also need to do more work into understanding how it is that rocky uh, planets obtain the composition they do. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, for listening and your attention. <laughs>